Hello everyone, welcome to PMF IS Current Affairs Prelims Test Series. My name is Ashish Malik. This is the second part of your test number 5 where we would be discussing the next 20 questions. But before we begin our discussion, here is something very very special for all of you guys. So if so far you have not checked out the uh, entire test series of the prelims um, PMF IS test series, do make sure that you go and check out the test series which is now available at a very very special price of just 499 which comprises of 1000 high quality MCQs. The link is given in description below. So do check it out before the uh, special offer expires. Now coming to the question number 21. This is a typical question from the polity which specifically has mentioned you about the article 200 and uh, which exactly relates to the governor and uh, his power with respect to the passing of the bills. Why this particular news you know uh, the role of the governor is very much in the question, uh, specifically many uh, states which are now run by the, uh, the parties other than the BJP. So those uh, opposition ruled states are actually blaming and complaining about the governor, even the Supreme Court, that the governor is not passing their bills. And you know that unless until the governor does not pass the bill, it, it can never become an act. So considering that that kind of background in your head so we have to first understand about the article 200 and the powers that governor has with respect to the passing of the bills so yes this is very important for you to um, you know specifically remember some of the articles like this article 200 that addresses the power of the governor with respect to the passing of the bills and under this particular article um, governor has many powers like for example uh, under this article if the, if the governor gets the bill which is passed by the Vidhan Sabha governor has many options like for, first of all he can straight away give the assent say yes and the bill becomes an act or the governor can withhold the assent third option is it can also reserve that bill for president consideration of course for that to happen there are certain criterias let me tell you this very interesting thing if a bill is to be reserved for president consideration or not, this is actually a discretionary power of the governor where, where he is not bound by the advice of a council of ministers. It is his own decision if the bill is to be reserved for the president consideration or not. And sometimes he also has the option number four, which is he can simply return the bill and request the house to reconsider it. But there is one condition. If after returning the bill, uh, the state assembly with or without amendment, if they are going to pass the bill again, then there is no choice to the governor. He must give his assent in that particular case. So only rejection can be done once. So now the problem is when the governor opts for the option number two, withholding a bill, neither say yes nor say no, simply keeping it with him. And, and that actually goes with lots and lots of delay in making the law because there is no definite period which is mentioned in the constitution. There is no limit like within, within what particular limit the governor is supposed to give the assent. But the, everything is mentioned under article 200. Now very interestingly like, uh, like we were mentioning about the governor power. So um, when it comes to reserving the bill for the president consideration. Um, interestingly, the governor governor uh, has this power of discretion. Uh, okay, so this already I have explained. Yeah, uh, reservation of the president. Yes. So let's see what the what the statement says. So if you go if you look at the question, guys, uh, you will understand. The first statement is absolutely correct because it says uh, Article two hundred having the governor giving the power with respect to all that and even reserving the bill for the con president consideration and even second is correct uh, when if the bill is returned then of course the governor uh, must uh, uh, you know give the assent if by chance if after returning the house passes the bill again even then governor can still reserve the bill for the president consideration that is one case which can be done once the matter goes to the president remember it is the president decision that is going to be final and governor does not really enjoy any further power on that bill. If president is being involved, then the rest of the matter to be decided by the president himself. 
So both statements are correct. Very straightforward question, very simple question. I think uh, all of us must, must have attempted it with, with a lot of ease. That takes us to the question number 22, which is with respect to Article 19. We know that Article 19 stands for freedom of speech and freedom of expression. But as you know that every freedom, every fundamental right is bound by some reasonable restrictions. I'm sure you must have heard this word, word called reasonable restriction. I mean, in the name of freedom of expression, I am not supposed to do any nonsense thing. I am not supposed to do any immoral kind of act in the name of freedom of speech and expression, right? So, not just this. Every fundamental right is subjected to reasonable restrictions. When it comes to Article 19, what can be the grounds for such kind of reasonable restrictions? And you just have to apply your logic. You don't really have to be genius for that. Imagine, I mean, in the name of freedom of speech and expression, what kind of limits you are supposed to have? Public order, of course, are not supposed to do anything which is going to disturb the public order. Yes, morality is, the, is a very good base. I'm not supposed to do any immoral act in the name of uh, Article 19. Contempt of the court, yes. Defamation in the name of freedom of speech. I'm not supposed to defame somebody. There is a thin line of expressing my views or expressing my hate. Speaking the information or spreading the misinformation. So there is a gap. So uh, this is a thin line and that, that is where the reasonable restriction comes. And of course, even in the case where the friendly relations we have with our foreign states, I'm not supposed to make any nonsense comment that is going to disturb the uh, relations with, with any of the countries, right? All seems very logical. Answer is D, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Very easy, very easy to attempt. So uh, do read about the reasonable restrictions and not just them, like some of them we have mentioned. Other than that, there, there are other uh, grounds for that reasonable restriction, including the sovereignty of India, integrity of the India, even public safety is one such ground where the fundamental rights can be curtailed, security of the state and uh, or if you are going to do something in the name of freedom of expression uh, that is going to have insight the you know kind of uh, offense and make people do some offense of course everything can be curtailed. So very logical question very simple forward question. <clears throat> Next is about the APEC which is the Asia Pacific Economic Forum. Um, very important uh, forum it, it is. So let's see uh, what you are supposed to learn first. So Asia Pacific. First of all, uh, India is not a member of uh, this APEC. APEC, uh, see, um, India is not really a party of all these kind of uh, economic forums, which focuses more on Pacific Ocean. Of course, India is supposed to be member of those kind of forums with Indian Ocean as a focus, not the, not the Pacific area. So considering that part, you can simply rule out the option number two. So now I have only two options. At least this is wrong. So I'm left with the other options. Okay, now first learn about the APEC, then we'll come back to that. So as you know, APEC, which is Asia Pacific Economic Forum, it is a regional, as the name says, name is regional. Why? Only focuses Asia and Pacific. It's a regional economic forum. It was established way back in 1989. The purpose of this was basically uh, promoting the free trade across the Asia Pacific regions. Now, though it was conceptualized in 1989, it actually formally came into the origin in 1993. Okay. Initially, it had 12 members. Now it has more than 21 members. But very carefully, India is not a member of the APEC. So you, now you know the purpose, why it was formed. How many members? India clearly not a part of it. Though India has applied, let me tell you this very frankly. Though India has applied uh, uh, for this membership, but still India's quest has not been accepted. And this is really wondering why. Because India qualifies in many of the parameters. Because this group talks about the economic growth. India is one of the fastest growing econ economy, right? Uh, it talks about having significant role in the international trade. Even that criteria is not considered for India. I mean, this is really nonsense, but India deserves a, uh, to be a part of all this. But the point is the EPIC membership is actually considering more on the Pacific rim of the countries, those countries which are bordering the Pacific Ocean. India still having a coastline considerable, uh, uh, you know, in the Indian Ocean. Maybe that is why 
it, India is not being granted the membership of the APEC. Now, please understand with respect to APEC, there is something called as the Bogor Goals. Now, this, this is very important. In total, all the 21 members of the APEC accounts for approximately 2.8 billion people representing 60% of the world GDP and 40% of the world trade. So that makes sense why this APEC is so important in the global market. In 1993, APEC came formally into the origin. Next year, 1994, there was a Bogor summit. That grouping came up with the Bogor goal. So just, the, just after one year of the formation, APEC members adopted the Bogor goals. What exactly Bogor goals are? They are actually set up the targets for realizing the free and open trade. I mean, uh, the formal idea, the, the, the uh, formal beginning of the idea of free trade and open trade actually began with the Bogor goals 1994. And the target was set by the APEC countries. Two things you have to remember. And uh, when, when this idea was conceptualized, the Bogor goals, it said that, you know, um, Asia Pacific is going to have a free open trade and a lot of investment by 2010 for all the developed economies and for developing the target year was 2020. Of course, everything is not fulfilled yet. The Bogor goals, you can't say they are 100% successful, but yes, at least now you know the idea about the Bogor goals. So, um, yes, Bogor goals are ready to APEC. Very good, very correct. First, so one and three are correct. India not a member. So your answer is going to be only two. I would say this question, especially the Bogor goals make his little bit of medium kind of thing. But uh, going by the logic, you can still take a risk. But because at least first two options are very easy to understand and you know which statement you are going to eliminate. So yes, you can risk this statement considering India's position, India's, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, position in terms of geographical uh, context. Question 24 was with respect to the global south. I'm sure you guys are listening this word left, right and center. Everyone today is talking about global south, global south. <clears throat> you think of global south, think India as a leader. One very important hint. You think of global south, think India as the leader of global south. You know what the global south is, right? Um, you know, this expression is actually used for the developing, less developed and the underdeveloped countries, right? I mean... It's not like, it's, it should not be used in that way, but it is what it is. So if you look at the map first, let me, let me show you this very interesting map. So uh, here there is a rough demarcation. So all these countries, you have the, the North America, excluding the Mexico, like Canada, US, most of the European countries, even the Russia, Russian part of, uh, uh, you know, and Australia, New Zealand. So all these are considered to be part of global north. Global north signifies the developed world and rest of the countries of Africa, Latin America, you know, all these are going to be, uh, uh, you know, called the global south countries as you, as you can see. So all these, entire South America, Africa, complete Asia, this is all part of global south, means still developing, underdeveloped or less developed. So this is a rough demarcation which is done. Um, there are characteristics, certain characteristics based on the global south. Like every global south today is going to have these kind of traits. Lower levels of income development, larger populations, more diverse culture, history of colonialism, imperialism, greater vulnerability to the climate change, growing role in global economy. You may have a question. Let's see you have a question MCQ on which of the following can be the traits of global south so read from that perspective as well right very important now when it comes to global south i told india is a leader why i'm i'm saying that because recently the voice of global south summit was initiated by india and this summit became a uh, it became a common platform for all the global south countries to share their perspective on major issues india provided that common platform India hosted the very first, uh, uh, this Voice of Global South in January 2023. The theme was unity of voice, unity of purpose. In fact, in that summit, India inaugurated Dakshin. Dakshin is actually a global center for excellence for the global South countries. You be prepared, you have a separate MCQ coming on Dakshin as well. So what Dakshin is, it's a global center of excellence 
for all the global south countries so now if you consider the two statements so both statements look very much okay very much fine so very easy question easy to attempt answer is going to be c do prepare dakshin dakshin is important as a separate question as well right <clears throat> now question number 25 this question says about extended fund facility the EFF and you are supposed to figure out uh, uh, from this so what is this extended fund facility let's learn and then we'll come back talking about the extended fund facility it is actually a lending facility uh, uh, fund by the IMF international monetary fund it's a lending facility of this IMF so very very factual thing but very important basic thing now that is where the problem happens when you are not confident you are not aware about which particular bigger organization or institute has all these subsidiary funding uh, lending facilities so extended fund facility relates to IMF best way to remember like how I remember EFF relates to IMF if you remember it this way like the short way it stuck more in your head right okay why this fund why this facility was started by IMF number one to address the medium and long term balance of payment problems it's, it's not a new thing they started it way back in 1974 the basic purpose is to actually help assist the countries who are having serious balance of balance of payment crisis balance of payment crisis happens uh, it can happen for many reasons maybe because of structural weakness of the economy maybe because of slow economic growth or many countries have inherently some weak balance of payments to act to help in all these cases the extended fund uh, facility was started by the IMF right now very interestingly uh, this these extended arrangements under the EFF they are typically approved for three years in general but in some cases it may be approved for as long as four years also depending on case depending on situations normally the EFF is granted for three years itself now look at the questions and now you know the answer the first one is wrong EFF is not by the World Bank remember the short e -E EFF IMF so it is started by initiative of the IMF that makes one as wrong second third are correct yes it talks about medium long term balance of payment and uh, extended period three year can be extended to four so these are more factual questions now I would say this question I would say it was a tough one because this is this is not very popular very famous kind of topic it was a tough one you only risk if you are having good knowledge about it you can risk it but there is no there is absolutely no clue no guesswork so if you are not aware about anything in this question please skip it because it will it will uh, you know make you make you make you fall in trouble because this question is really really challenging and tough question 26 was a very important question because it talks about the Red Sea few countries are given very typical type question of the UPSC countries are given and you are asked that which country border the Red Sea now for that only thing that can save you is your map if you are good with the map if you if you have practices so my suggestion please every day try to at least see something on the map every day try to spend uh, 15 to 20 minutes on the map before you go to your exam and also try to uh, focus more on the places in news because from this particular section do expect at least three to four questions coming out like like six to eight marks are going to be purely map based in the upcoming exam now if you talk about the red sea look just have a look at that look at the map guys so if you look at the red sea this is where the red sea is <clears throat> right so uh, red sea uh, on the on the north side red sea we have the suez canal this is the uh, suez canal that we have after red sea if you are going to get out of the red sea you have the gulf of aden right now please look at the countries which are having borders with red sea saudi arabia is one yes yemen is the another one true Eritrea is the one yes Djibouti is also uh, having boundary with the Red Sea does Ethiopia this country is Ethiopia does Ethiopia has uh, 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 you know boundary with it no it does not have a boundary uh, with Ethiopia Ethiopia itself is a landlocked country Sudan has a connection it's a boundary Egypt has a boundary please remember the Red Sea 
extends as to uh, marginal water bodies this is called the Suez can this is called the Gulf of Suez and this is called the Gulf of Aqaba now Gulf of Aqaba has has a connection with Jordan but the Red Sea does not have any connection directly with Jordan or Israel Israel and Jordan both have a connection with Gulf of Aqaba not the Red Sea so if you look at the question now you know the facts and if you now you know the question look at the question once so clearly you, you now you have the now you have the answer that you you must eliminate Jordan from the option because it makes connection with Gulf of Aqaba and you are also supposed to eliminate Somalia Somalia does not have any connection with the Red Sea so very typical map based question very very fact based question absolutely no space for guesswork it's purely fact so answer is going to be only four Egypt Saudi Yemen and Sudan and you know the other answers as well I would say this was a tough one it was an easy if you are good with the maps if you don't have a good knowledge of the map this is a nightmare question so I would say don't take risk unnecessary you can skip only attempt it if you have knowledge of the maps otherwise this this question is not to be touched <clears throat> very fact based question next question 27 is with respect to the WHO okay um, let's see this question comes on the WHO at least we have some basic knowledge about the WHO it's a very famous organization worldwide right is it a specialized agency of the UN yes it is a specialized agency we know UN anytime UN has to speak from the health perspective it always speaks on the uh, like the WHO always speak on the behalf of UN so UN is a WHO is a specialized agency of UN started in 1948 it says all all UN member a little bit I'm very uh, skeptical about it it says all UN members are the member of WHO as well I doubt because it's it's not necessary that whosoever is a part of UN is also going to be part of WHO it's it doesn't happen very very rarely it happens so that that actually makes me think this question or this statement is not correct then it says the director general of WHO hold office for five years now this is again a tricky part this is very I don't know it can be four year it can be three year can be five year you really can't guess if it was an Indian scenario we know that in India maximum things are appointed for five years right uh, but I'm, I'm not sure about it as well so for that you need to know in this case you can still risk this question because at least first and second I, I have figured out the only chance now in this case yes the statement is correct there is no doubt in this case the uh, this first and third are correct answer is my only two with elimination of number two so this question yes it was a medium level question but something that you could have risked because first and second are easy options third you can take a risk at least if you are in a position to do so so talking about the WHO we, we have understood specialized agency of the UN uh, headquarters are in Geneva Switzerland see why the second statement was wrong out of 194 member 194 members we have all UN members but there are exceptions there are few countries which are part of UN but not part of WHO for example Liechtenstein is not a part of WHO Cook Island New these are not a part of this so only 192 countries are part of WHO so now you have some exceptions right and always be prepared that all is a very dangerous word you have to be very careful about it uh, we already have mentioned we said that yes the director general of the WHO is going to hold the office for five years and can be reappointed as well this is a star mark option sometimes there are certain offices where reappointment is not permitted but in the case of WHO reappointment is possible one extra fact about the WHO you have to remember it is World Health Assembly that is the highest decision making body of the WHO and everything is decided the all agenda everything decided by the World Health Assembly very interesting and important information guys going by the next question which is National Food Security Act this is something which India should be proud of and we are very proud of this particular scheme that Indian government is running since 2013 so what exactly we have to learn and know about the Food Security Act this act was enacted in 2013 why this was act why this act was made 
as the name says food security so the objective is very clear the objective was to provide food and nutritional security to the citizens of india how by giving them quality food at affordable prices that was the basic idea please understand under the national food security act 50% urban population is targeted and 75% rural population is targeted but because we believe rural population need more support in terms of food and nutritional security under this particular act 5 kg per person per month is allowed we are going to give them rice wheat and coarse grain at a subsidized rate of 3 rupees 2 rupees and 1 rupees respectively right the poorest of the poor households they will continue to receive 35 kg per household per month even under the antodaya an yojana that is again going to uh, you know supplement all the efforts of national food security act remember this guys now this while making all the national food security uh, plan even the states has a very important role to play the state and the union territory it is their job to identify the households the eligible households who are eligible for the scheme who are going to be the targeted beneficiaries it is the job of state and the uts they have to identify and uh, they have to determine that okay this these are the uh, beneficiaries which we are going to give the free ration in fact even for the for the purpose of issuing the ration card uh, you know whenever that is that is done how the scheme is going to be monitored please understand the scheme is going to issue a ration card in the name of the eldest women it's it is also empowering women in one way because the eldest women whosoever in the family above the age of 18 and that is considered to be the house you know head of the household and every beneficiary or every benefit is to be given in the name of that women and that is how it is also not just the food security it is also talking about the social empowerment of the women right that that is a very hidden but very powerful thing that the scheme has very interestingly under this scheme under the national food security act where we are giving highly subsidized food grains it also includes it also assist and take uh, uh, take support of the integrated child development service scheme the icds one of the most important scheme when it comes to the uh, you know nutrition of child and mother so under the scheme even this free nutritious meal is given to the pregnant women and the lactating mothers and even the children up to 6 year of the age free nutritious meal to children 16 6 to 14 year of age is also given under midday meal scheme plus the scheme is so comprehensive it also includes the maternity benefits of up to 6000 rupees to pregnant women and lactating mothers so this scheme is not just the food and nutrition security it is much much more guys now here the first and the third statements are correct without any problem now the problem you have is with the age of the household lady so the eldest woman is not going to be 25 plus every woman who is who who is going to be 18 plus of the age is going to be considered as the as the head of the household to uh, give the benefits of the scheme so yes second statement is wrong my answer is going to be only two so but but again i what i would say this question was a tough one for many students because every statement has fact fact and only fact in such scenario if you are not aware about the facts don't take the risk it is better to skip but now since we have learned it i'm sure in in your exam you are going to uh, handle it very well next question is again going to test your map knowledge i'm i'm telling you guys you must spend 15 20 minutes with the map every day next question is about the kara isthmus what is an isthmus it's a narrow strip of land that connects the two larger land bodies right now kara isthmus where we have this kara isthmus because it is in news uh, uh, you know a lot of time please look at the map first <clears throat> can you see gulf of thailand yes can you see andaman sea here right sir so between these two water bodies we have this narrow strip of land called the kara isthmus which actually connects the above majorly land based southeast asia with the maritime southeast asia that's how it's connecting the two larger land masses 
please remember when i use the word strait it is only about it all all relates to water narrow strip of water connecting the two larger water bodies similarly if i am talking about the isthmus it's it is only about the land narrow piece of land connecting the two lands so now you know very well on the map and why this kara isthmus was in news because now thailand with the help of china they are planning to construct a bridge over this patch which which is going to make the communication and transportation between the two water bodies even easier and faster so far the only way is to actually risk yourself and to come from the strait of Malak, malacca which is a very crucial choke point so now only way that you have to come out from south china sea is this only strait of malacca now this is going to be an alternative and even better alternative uh, to the strait of malacca that why this particular kara isthmus was very much in news not just this guys try to learn more and more about all the isthmus and straits which were in the news for some reason uh, okay and yes when uh, thailand is going to make uh, this so called bridge it's a land bridge which they are they want to make uh, it it is also going to include lot of uh, you know two large capacity port shipping terminals also going to include the oil pipelines for the for the sake of transport because ultimately we are looking for alternative to strait of malacca very important and china is supporting the cause of course china has very strategic interest into that right that make very sense otherwise why china will support anything like that china will only do if, if it is going to serve its own strategic interest so kara isthmus you have the option in front of you it is the arabia uh, it is the andaman sea and the gulf of thailand so very straight forward question easy can be attempted but tough for those people who have no knowledge of the map so in that case better to skip because there is absolutely nothing you can take a clue upon question number 30 was with respect to the samudrayaan mission very important mission samudrayaan so samudrayaan is india's first manned deep ocean mission yes it is our first deep like like we have the space project no we have the deep space projects the same way we also have deep ocean projects and in this we are going to study ocean as deep as possible and it is a manned mission manned mission means it is also going to include some people actually sitting in that particular uh, submarine which are which is going to go deeper and deeper and deeper that makes it a manned mission but please understand <clears throat> normally what is the average depth of ocean my average depth of ocean is 4000 meter and when i say deep ocean deep ocean is something which we consider till 6000 meter or something now the question has a problem it says it is going to study more than 8000 meter now this is exaggeration it it's the fact is wrong samudra mission everything is fine but problem with the depth so that makes first statement as a wrong one okay this is very important and uh, interesting guys so now it says the ministry of the earth sciences is the nodal ministry that implements it yes sir the nodal ministry is the one uh, the ministry of earth sciences actually whenever you think about any ocean mission i am giving you very interesting fact any time you think of the ocean mission there is only one ministry that takes off that take care of such kind of mission that is ministry of earth sciences so keep this hint in your head and i'm sure in in the exam if something like that comes you are in a position to handle that very easily guys right okay so first is not correct like the depth i i've told you guys uh, it it is important but since it is india's first man deep mission do expect mcq coming on that do expect because this is going to be upsc is one of the favorite topic why why this mission is so crucial it has many components it has six components in total like uh, in the samudrayaan mission we are going to develop the deep sea mining techniques we are also going to have we are also going to make the manned submersible as well also we are going to create ocean climate and change advisory services there is going to be innovation for deep sea biodiversity exploration it is going to talk about multi metal hydrothermal mineral sites how we can harness the energy of the oceans how we can use the fresh water from the oceans how we can convert ocean water as a fresh water right 
and it also talks about establishing advanced marine station for ocean biology so all these mission all the component makes samudrayaan something i would say a star mark it's a very important question you should prepare for your upcoming exam guys second is correct but third is again not correct why it is not correct guys because the matsya 600 6000 is indigenously built but it's a manned submersible that we have created for this particular mission very very important and look at the questions if you look at the question guys the problem is it says it is a submarine it is not a submarine matsya 6000 is not a submarine it's a submersible manned submersible so third is wrong first is wrong the second is correct okay so be careful now again this question was a tough one tough question uh something you can take a risk it, at least if you are able to figure out the two statements out of three then you can take otherwise you can skip because this but but again but my suggestion is do prepare this topic upsc is definitely going to target it because it's so important and strategic from indian perspective that takes us to the question number 31 which is about nalsa nalsa is the Le national legal service authority of india um nalsa is a constitutional body and is the chief justice is the executive chairman of nalsa both statements are not correct both are wrong please learn something about nalsa what is nalsa why it was set up yes it was established 1995 but it is not a constitutional body nalsa is a statutory body because it was constituted under the act of parliament legal service authorities act so that's why it is a statutory body not a constitutional one the objective why nalsa and this act was passed the only purpose was the speedy disposal of the cases and reducing the judiciary's burden unfortunately it is still not the case even right now in 2024 after say 21 years of this act judiciary is still under burden with lots and lakhs and lakhs of cases are still pending but again nalsa the purpose you may have a separate question on nalsa as well so what are the purposes of nalsa you should be aware of number 1 going to provide free legal services to the weaker section this is a very very important uh, point that you have to remember about nalsa nalsa is also responsible for orga uh, organizing the lok adalats which which is which is a part of alternative dispute resolution which is going to settle the disputes outside the regular courts nalsa is also responsible for organizing all the legal awareness camps especially in the rural areas it is also responsible for establishing a nationwide uniform network that is going to provide free and competent legal services to the weaker sections of society so please remember all these purpose are very very important that you have to remember see when it comes to the composition of nalsa chief justice of india is actually a patron in chief of the nalsa but the second senior most judge of the supreme court is going to be executive chairman it is not the cgi that becomes the executive chairman and that you can clearly see make the both statements as incorrect medium question something you could have attempted very easily a very fact based question so here which are correct neither neither one nor two both are incorrect question number 32 the central bureau of communication c b c very very important question now this let's first understand what this central bureau of communication and why it is in the news and we'll come back to the question guys it says the very first statement says the central bureau of commission communication it is an advertising wing okay that makes sense communication is an advertising wing wing of which ministry it is actually advertising wing of the government of india entire government of india but the cbc actually works under the ministry of information and broadcasting because it's an advertising agency you know and for that purpose there has to be information and broadcasting so very logical connection of the cbc with the ministry of ib in 2017 it, it was formulated before that there were different different instruments like for example there used to be directorate of advertising visual publicity you know some other divisions were there song drama division now everything is clubbed everything is integrated and everything was amalgamated as cbc after 
This particular CBC provides a 360 degree communication solution to the ministries, the PSUs, even to the autonomous body. The main purpose is educating the people about the government policies through various communication channels. And for that purpose, for, for uh, putting out the government policies in people's domain, the CBC utilizes the print media, it utilizes audio video, visual, visual campaigns, exhibition, outdoor campaigns, digital media, everything is covered by CBC. Now please remember one more fact. So now in India, we have a digital advertisement policy 2023 that actually empowers the CBC to undertake the advertising campaigns even on social media, OTD platforms and other digital medias as well because right now it's a trend. So that's why the CBC powers were actually modified and now we have after the amendment, after this new digital advertisement policy, we have included the trends of the present and the future as well. So that is one thing that you have to remember. If you go to the go back to the question guys, very logical. It says Central Bureau of Communication is advertisement wing under Ministry of Communication. No, it is Ministry of IB uh, Information and Broadcasting. So very easy to predict because I'm talking about the communication. Don't don't get the bait. Don't get confused with Ministry of Communication. We have the Ministry of Information. Do we have any Ministry of Communication? No. The, is, there, is there any ministry called Ministry of Communication? There is a tele, Telecom Ministry is different one. We have a Telecommunication Ministry, but don't we don't have anything called as Ministry of Communication. We have Information and Broadcasting. So you can straight away eliminate the first one. And yes, going by the logic, what this Central Bureau of Communication now, of course, it is going to include all these platforms after 2023 bill. So option is to question is medium, but something you could have attempted by applying a little bit of common sense in this case, right? Question 33 is about employee state insurance called the ESI scheme. Now, first let's talk about the ESI and then we'll come back and we'll try to solve the question. Now this employee state insurance scheme, it is actually an integrated measure which is started uh, uh, of the social insurance and uh, for that purpose this employee state insurance scheme was formulated. Now the scheme is actually administered by employee state insurance corporation which is called ESIC which is an autonomous corporation working under ministry of labor and employment. Now ministries are very very crucial guys very very important I'm talking about the insurance so I'm talking, how to remember, I'm talking about the insurance, right? I'm talking about employee's benefit. Employee benefit, I'm talking about the worker. I'm talking about the labor of this country. So that way you can relate the insurance scheming, scheme having a connection with Ministry of Labor and Employment. So that is one way because I'm talking about the benefit of employee. That's why this, this ministry make a lot of sense. So remember that logic, right? Anything which is about labor, worker, employee, you have the Ministry of Labor and Employment. That is interesting. Second point is under the ESI scheme, it applies to factories. It also applies to other establishments that consist of road, transport, hotels, restaurants, cinema, newspaper, any, any kind of establishment which is having 10 or more than 10 people as their employees. So every organization Every establishment having 10 or more employees, it is going to be subjected under the ESI scheme. Very interestingly. Also remember one more thing here. That is, the ESI scheme is financed by the contributions of employer and the employees. And the rate of the contribution by the employer is going to be 3.25% of the wages payable to the employee. Remember, employees who, whoever are earning up to 176 rupees per day as a daily wage, they are actually exempted from the payment of their share of the contribution. The government, government is still going to contribute, but their share is not going to be taken because see, this is a very minimum wages that they, these guys are earning. If you look at the question, now you know the answer that uh, the problem is with the fact. And again, this is something you can't guess. Please understand. This question, again, I would say it, would, it was a very tough question because every statement is just fact oriented. 
I mean, I can't guess if it is 137 or 176. You can't really guess. But now you know since you can eliminate number 3. 1, 2 being correct. But again, very tough question. Answer is B. You can skip. You must skip it if you are not confident because see, everything is so fact-based. Everything except the first one. First one I can figure out myself. Yes, ministry is okay. But what about 21,000 per month and 137 rupees per day? This is very fact-based. So try to uh, you know attempt these questions only if you have full knowledge about it that brings us to the question number 34 that talks about the social audit guys now what is a social audit <clears throat> this because this question is talking about social audit talking about the role of social audit in manrega now two things are very interesting first let's understand what is the meaning of social audit and rest of the question becomes easy for us when I use the word social audit, it is actually a process where the citizens of the country, they participate, common people like you and me, we participate in the assessment of socio-economic, environmental, ethical performance of the programs and functioning of the government departments. If people like you and me are encouraged and invited to do the inspection of the work, like not like some somebody from the higher office offices are come no common people like you and me citizens are participating in the assessment of the government program that is what social social audit is and why this is so important because social social audit is based on the principles of the democratic local governments in fact social audit is a true picture is a true benchmark if you want to judge if this is a democratic local governance or not. Now, this is actually used as a tool of empowerment. When you are when you are encouraging the common citizens to participate in the government assessment, guys, you are using social audit as a tool of the empowerment. It enables government to identify the problem because these people, they know better their local issues. Whenever, when it comes to addressing the local issues, Yes, these people know better than anybody because they are the ones suffering from it every day. Okay, this is the social audit kind of thing. Now, Manrega is so special act. Manrega not just promises 100 days of guaranteed employment. It also was the first government scheme that mandated the social audit by Gram Sabha for all the projects to be taken in the Gram Panchayat. And that makes Manrega a true democratic kind of act, which encourages the people to participate, not just as an, as an employees, but also as a part of social audit. In India, Meghalaya was the first state to operationalize the social audit law. The, this is pure fact. You please remember it carefully. In India, out of, the out of the, all the states and the UTs, there are only six states in India so far, they have completed the social audit work of Manrega. I mean, still this concept is more on paper. You can see it is more on paper and people are, and, the, and the state governments are still not really willing to implement it. So if you look at the statement number three and four, now you know Maharashtra is not that state, it is Meghalaya that has the first state to operationalize the law and again, <coughs> I would rather say start from the statement number four. Now statement number four says all the states have completed social audit. Now this makes the statement very exaggerated. Do you know it is very difficult in India for all the state and UTs to come at the same page by you know impl by implementing something like Manrega. So all I'm not sure. I, let's see. I don't know if six have completed or ten have completed. But at least I know. All state UTs is not possible because in, in uh, because you know when state has to implement something, it's it becomes really difficult for all states to implement the same thing at the same level. So option four is definitely going to be wrong. So at least I could have eliminated these two. My only options were one and two and two and three. And if I know the meaning, if I know the definition of social audit, which I can very easily guess from the statement number one. That makes my answer as A and B. That also helps me understand that it is not the Maharashtra uh, becoming the first state to operationalize the law. So actually my elimination technique has helped me to get the right answer as one and two. Understand? 
so that is sometimes that is the way the question looks tough but becomes very very easy when you apply without getting confused uh, apply your common sense and solve try to solve the question guys that takes us to the question number 35 the question is about the sensex commissioner of india very important question uh, does it work under the home ministry yes when it comes to the sense because we know that the sensex is the responsibility of the home ministry right so sensex commissioner of course is going to function under the home ministry of home affairs so first definitely correct now think about it it's the sensex commissioner so, of course, it is going to have the responsibility of conducting the housing and population census in India. Yes, it does. Then it says the census commissioner also designated as registrar journal of India. Yes, it does. So, in this case, all my three options, very simple, very simple questions, very easy and very easy to attempt also. So, please remember uh, a few things about it. Okay. Okay. Uh, I think we missed something. Okay. Fine. 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 Sorry. Look at the statement number two. We missed one very important thing. It says it's a constitutional authority. It is not constitutional. Sensex Commissioner of India, it is not constitutional. It is a statutory authority. Okay, we missed that point. So it is a statutory authority, not constitutional. Uh, because we have we have uh, we have appointed the Sensex Commissioner under the Sensex Act 1948. That is very, very important, guys. And that makes the option number two as the incorrect one. Okay. Remaining things are fine. The functioning is okay. But the only problem is with this. I uh, forgot. I'm sorry that I, I forgot to see that. First and third are correct. The second is wrong. So answer is going to be only two. Still easy. Still you can attempt it very, very easily. Uh, be careful about the statutory and all that stuff. Right. This is important. Uh, Sensex commissioner designated as the registrar journal. Yes. Uh, when at by at what particular level so the cc works as rgi under the registration of the birth and death act okay that is important and these are the functions which are conducted by the rgi housing population census civil registration system sample registering system you know national population register npr it is important you expect one question on that as well right this is interesting Okay, uh, my one question to all of you guys, since we're talking about the National Population Register, my question is, have you heard the word, word called as usual resident? This National Population Register is actually a repository of uh, usual residents of the country. What is the meaning of the term usual resident and how NPR is different from NRC? If you guys know the answer, I'm really willing to see your answer in the comment below so do tell me in the comment box what is the difference between the two and what is the meaning of usual resident that brings us to the question number 36 very important question zika virus it's it's not something which is in the news these days but there was a time when zika virus was really uh, you know creating fear in in the hearts of many people zika was a very infectious disease uh, and it's a viral disease right but Please understand, don't think that every virus disease is a bat born virus. No, it is not. Zika virus was actually related to the mosquitoes, not the bats. So first learn about it and then we'll come back and then we'll solve the question on the Zika virus. So Zika virus disease, infectious. Zika virus is actually a mosquito born flavivirus. virus. So bats has nothing to do. Which particular mosquito? We have the Aedes mosquito. This mosquito relates to many other uh, mosquito borne diseases like chikungunya, dengue. We have the lymphatic filariasis, rift valley fever, yellow fever, Zika virus. So this one particular Aedes, Aedes mosquito is very dangerous, relates to the maximum number of uh, mosquito borne diseases, right? Now, as of now, even today, there is no specific vaccine for Zika virus. Only specific treatment is available, but there is no vaccine. Why? Again, because it, it, is, it is very difficult to get a vaccine for the viral infection. I mean, COVID, COVID uh, was a very exception where the world really, really did the things very fast and uh, entire world uh, cop up to, you know, get a, 
get a vaccine in no record in a, in a record time so uh, but in general zika still does not have any vaccine zika is very contagious very contagious spread through many things from sexual contact transfusion of the blood even from the pregnancy means from mother to the fetus so it also can become uh, uh, you know this uh, transferable disease uh, from one generation to the another one so very very important please understand when i'm specifically talking about the complications in the pregnancy caused by zika there is one thing i need to mention there is one condition called as microcephaly very very important thing zika's discussion is incomplete without mentioning the microcephaly you know in zika virus it is responsible for this neurological condition where the baby that is going to be born is going to have significantly very smaller head than the usual of their age and sex so this small headed babies was a neurological condition that was actually triggered by zika virus in fact considering that threat who declared microcephaly a public health emergency of international concern way back in 2016 you understand the level when it when when it comes to the symptoms the symptoms are very very similar to other infections uh, caused by the by the uh, you know mosquito uh, viral disease like you have the chikungunya dengue the symptoms are very simple we have rash we have fever we have conj conjunctivitis then we have muscle joint pain now these are very very similar to the other one but again with respect to zika virus there are many major concern associated though the symptoms look very common as other things but what makes zika deadly is these kind of conditions we have the gulian barre syndrome again a very rare neurological disorder that is going to cause body's immune system to attack its own so if you have this kind of condition relates to zika virus it also has condition called as uh, the myelitis which is inflammation of the spinal cord neuropathy it is again a major condition of zika virus where uh, it is going to damage the nerves outside of the brain and the spinal cord and then you have something called as the myelin sheath uh, a fatty substance that insulates and protect the uh, nerve fibers that is also going to get impacted by the zika virus now if you come back <clears throat> if you come back to the question very fact based thing but please understand try to eliminate the options at least you know that zika has nothing to do with the bat it it is it is purely a mosquito based virus so if i eliminate my option number 1 at least i am in a position to get my answer right sometimes if you are lucky and if you have knowledge about just one fact you can still get the answer by eliminating the option now here you have the option second correct fourth is correct and of course third is correct now we have one it says it does not spread from mother it it does of course it does and uh, it creates the microcephaly kind of condition right so yeah the question was a medium one but very easy to understand because we are in a position to eliminate the options very clearly guys i hope you are clear about zika now <clears throat> now question number 37 pvtgs we have done it so many times we already have done pvtgs in previous test it was just one more attempt for from our side to make sure that you understand the pvtgs well it says pvtgs are more vulnerable it the name says particularly vulnerable tribal groups right so yes the first one is correct it it says the currently there are 75 pvtgs yes we have 75 total out of total tribes 75 tribes are given the status of pvtgs with odisha having the highest number of pvtgs was that the urijit patel commission nothing to do with it we have done it so many times it was the devhar commission that actually uh, you know suggested to create a specific category uh, as a primitive tribal groups so that and of course that category was uh, based on certain uh, parameters like if any tribal group is having a primitive traits maybe that uh, group is suffering from geographical isolation or having low literacy very negative or zero population kind of rate or having a general backwardness considering all these factors the separate category for primitive tribal group was made by devar commission later on this was renamed as pvtgs so in this i have my uh, three options as correct of course the urijit patel commission is not related to that but do you know 
for what purpose Urijit Patel commission was set up. If you know about this commission also, please tell me in the comment box. Let's see if you can figure out. This question was very easy, very easy to attempt because we have done it so many times, so many times. We need not to repeat it anyway. Next question is about the Stockholm Convention. Very careful. This is Stockholm Convention. There is another Stockholm which is Stockholm Conference. Okay, the two are very different. There is something called a Stockholm Conference also. Stockholm Convention is about the persistent organic pollutants, right? This is number one. Stockholm Conference is altogether different thing. So please be careful. The question is asking about the convention or the conference. By the way, what this Stockholm Conference about? If you, if you know the answer about the Stockholm Conference, again, you can tell me in the comment box if you have this extra information. Coming back to the Stockholm Convention once again, this convention talks about the persistent organic pollutants. Okay, please apply your common sense. You don't have to be genius to solve this question. It's the name persistent organic pollutant. The name persistent means it is going to have very long life. Why anything is going to be called as persistent? Because something which is going to stay for very very long time it is not easy to break them down so look at the statement it says they are unstable undergo natural breakdown no 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 persistent organic pollutants are very stable compounds they are very difficult to break down if if they were so easy to get break down naturally probably we would not need any convention for that right so second incorrect since we are talking about the organic pollutants you know in india pollution is a big problem of course, there is no chance why India would not be a party of it. Of course, India will be a party of anything that talks about the pollution and considering the facts like that, right? So, of course, just go by your logic. Of course, the in this case, the answer is D. Very easy because the, the, the question itself helping me out to figure out the answer. Now, I'll take, I'll take you to the details, guys. Talking about the Stockholm Convention, uh, this is basically an international environmental treaty that specifically talks about the persistent organic pollutants. India, of course, is a party to the convention. This convention uh, was aimed to actually protect the human health and environment from these harmful POPs, which is persistent organic pollutants. This treaty was adopted 2001, came into the force 2004. Okay. It includes 29 types of the POPs that includes many uh, things like pesticides, industrial chemicals, unintentional byproducts of the combustion process and so and so forth. But what exactly the POPs are? So for anything to be called as persistent organic pollutant, there are some characteristics. POPs are toxic. They, are, they can bioaccumulate in the living organisms and they can biomagnify in the food chain making them even more dangerous. They are very stable and they always resist to natural breakdowns. That is why the convention says we have to eliminate the emission of POPs. The more POPs are going, the more trouble they are creating for us. They can travel very long distances and once they are emitted, it becomes really impossible or very difficult to remove them guys. That is, that is what it is, right? Some examples, if let's say you, you get a question, which of the following are the POPs? So you have all these called PCBs, DDTs, all the organo, uh, organochlorine pesticide, all these compounds are classified as POPs. So now you know the answer, right? Just to sum up, so remember when you think about the persistent organic pollutants, they are, they are, they are those kind of chemicals which are of global concern and that is why Stockholm Convention was made to stop about it. Remember the four things, they always travel long distances, they are very persistent in the environment, very difficult to break down. They are always going to bioaccumulate and biomagnify, making them very dangerous and they have very negative effect on human health as well as the environment. Okay, that's why the Stockholm Convention is the treaty to eliminate all of them. And I'm really expecting you guys to give me the other op uh, answers as well. Maybe, maybe let's say you have, you have got a question on the example. So we know that DDT is one such example of the POP. Other than DDT, which is, which is thankfully banned for agricultural use in India, but somewhere it is still used probably. But yeah, DDT for agriculture purpose, we have banned completely. But we use DDT 
for fumigation against the mosquitoes. I'm sure you guys must have seen the people from the government, they are coming and, you know, they are spraying, so doing some fumigation, especially before the mosquito season begins. That maximum number of times that fumigation is done by the D, uh, using the DDT, okay? Other than DDT, we, you have the endosulfan, which is again an insecticide. You have the uh, polychlorinated biophenyls, dox, uh, dioxins. All of them are the example. Now, my suggestion to you, whenever you are reading about any chemical or POP, please do read about their use, do read about their application as well. You never know as a match the following kind of thing. UPSC can ask you, okay, this chemical is used where? So you may have these kind of questions coming up. So be careful about it. Question number 39. That takes us to the Ayushman Bharat Digital Mission. It is implemented by National Health Authority. Yes, sir. Earlier known as National Digital Health Mission. Yes, sir. Straightforward question. Straightforward answer. Both are correct. Very easy. And you can attempt it very easily. What facts you should remember with respect to the Ayushman Bharat Mission? So, you talk about the Ayushman Bharat Digital Mission. The word is digital important. So, of course, this whole concept was conceptualized as one of the key objective of our national health policy that we formulated way back in 2017. In, in our health policy 2017, we thought of creating a digital health technology ecosystem with an aim of developing an integrated health information because if you integrate the health information of the country, it really going to improve the efficiency, transparency and even going to make citizen experience way better because I'm going to link this data can be used across all the public or the private healthcare. So that is going to make the entire system of healthcare in India as a revolutionary one. So this idea was conceptualized and this is the product that we have delivered as ADBM, Ayushman Bharat Digital Mission. Please remember it's a central sector scheme, means 100% funding is to be given by the central government. But this uh, Ayushman Bharat Digital Mission, earlier the name was National Digital Health Mission, now this is the present name of this scheme. It is implemented by National Health Authority because National Health Authority is our apex body, the highest body for implementing Government of India's any flagship public health schemes. You think of any public health scheme, you always going to find National Health Authority as the apex body doing it. Other than Ayushman Digital Bharat, this authority is also implementing Ayushman Bharat Pradhan Mantri Jan Arogya Yojana under Ayushman Bharat Yojana. So not just this, this authority is responsible for many flagship public health. Now please understand another keyword. Keyword is flagship. Flagship programs are, are those uh, programs which are having the highest priority. You must have heard this word flagship program, pilot program, you know. So flagships are basically are of a highest priority. That's what the why they are called as flagship programs. Moving ahead with the next one guys. So now uh, and yeah, please one more thing. Whenever we discuss about Ayushman Bharat digital mission, please remember that this, these digital systems are involved. They are part of the Ayushman Bharat digital mission. Under this, we are going to get the ABHA number, which is Ayushman Bharat health account. This is our health ID that we are going to create for every, uh, uh, every patient, right? We also going to include the healthcare professional registry, health facility, facility registry, personal health records, unified health interfaces, everything is created as an ecosystem, as a digital ecosystem under Ayushman Bharat Digital Mission. Very important, you must prepare it guys. That brings us to the last question that is called the Sathi portal. But very careful, it says which statement is not correct with terms of Sathi portal. Okay, first let's learn about the Sathi portal, then we'll come back to that. So Sathi portal, Sathi means friend, okay. Now the Sathi portal is an initiative of Ministry of Education in association with IIT Kanpur. Sathi portal, the purpose, the main objective is to help the students in getting the learning resources. But what makes Sathi so important? It is that it uses the AI technology to interact with the students. 
that actually making their experience as a personalized learning experience that makes Sathi portal so much revolutionary. Because under the Sathi portal, we are going to use AI chatbots to help the students tailor their learning or customize their learnings according to their needs. That makes it very, very impressive platform. Remember the Ministry of Education is involved. Primary objective as the name says, Sathi means I'm your friend. So primary goal is to provide students with a free learning and assessment platforms, again using the AI technology. This objective, this Sathi portal actually aligns with the vision of National Education Policy 2020 of India, right? And this scheme also includes, the, the Sathi portal also includes the Sathi Mitras. Sathi Mitras is basically uh, to increase the coverage of the program in rural areas, focusing on rural areas as well. And especially those students who are preparing for the government entrance exam, like JWE, NWT kind of exams. So far, the, all the learning materials which are on Sathi portal, currently, they are available in the language English, Hindi, Odia and Telugu. Okay. Now, their plan is to extend to other languages, but right now, there are four languages which are there. If you go back to the question, now you clearly can see what the problem is with the question. It, it says that the learning material of the Sati available only in English and the no. There are four languages so far. So that makes three as the wrong one, eliminating these two. First, second are correct. So I have my answer as B. Now, again, this question, I would say this was a medium uh, kind of question. Uh, but again, very fact based. It was a medium level, but again, a very fact based. At least number three, you could have eliminated. That makes sense. But uh, how to choose? from one or two is still tricky because uh, I'm not sure if the ministry is correct. I can't be sure if it is IIT Kanpur only, can be IIT Kharagpur, can be IIT Bombay, can be IIT Delhi. I mean, you know, there are all the problems. So I would say don't unnecessarily risk it. This question looks easy, but it is actually tough. So skip because it has a lot of factual information. Second statement can still make a sense to me. I am I'm very sure I can eliminate this. Second is okay. But again, the problem is going to be on number one. So you can take a risk if you have the capacity. So in this case, it says which statement is not correct. So answer is supposed to be not correct is the one which is, uh, which is number three. So answer is going to be three. Okay. Not correct. No. Huh? So answer is going to be three. So even the elimination, uh, then I can eliminate B I could have eliminated and C I could have eliminated because I'm, I have to figure out the not correct one. So clearly three is not correct. So three has to be part of the answer. So yes. So answer is going to be either three or two and three. But yeah, now, now it becomes easy. Okay. Figure. Understand. Now it becomes easy. We have to figure out not correct. No. So uh, very clearly I can say the second looks absolutely correct. Because Sathi portal is going to be giving free learning assessment platform. So my two is definitely correct. So cannot be the answer. Now I would say the question was a medium one, but becomes easy given the options are not correct. If the question would have been to choose the correct one, then it becomes difficult. Now in this case, I think the elimination has helped you out a lot. So that way you have to proceed with these kind of questions. I really, really hope you have enjoyed and you have learned a lot from this video. If you if you did, then do let us uh, let us know in the comment below. And I'm looking forward for everyone to get most of the benefit from our test series. So do check out the link in the description below. My name is Ashish Malik. I am going to see you in the next video soon. Till then, stay blessed and keep preparing for the UPSC. All my best wishes. Jai Hind.